You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, I'm Matt Albers, host of the Pirate History Podcast. The men and women of the golden age of piracy are some of the most infamous and often misunderstood characters in all of human history. You know their names. Anne Bonny, Henry Avery, Mary Reed, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard. But do you know their stories, their real stories? Every week over on the Pirate History Podcast, we examine what made these pirates sail the high seas in search of plunder and adventure and revenge. If you'd like to hear the stories of the real men and women who went on the account and sailed under the black flag, join us on the Pirate History Podcast. Oh, the things that New Yorkers have created. The Empire State Building, pizza folded in half, the Waldorf, the Reuben, the Republican Party. A quick note, if you want to support this program, please go to www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. You can do it in two ways. First, you can purchase the archive, 1888. Yes, the year that Benjamin Harrison was elected, and we'll be talking about the unlucky President Harrison later in this cast. If you purchase the archive, you can download hours and hours of past episodes. It's going to take you to a URL. You're going to get that 24 hours after ordering or sooner. Go to the URL. All of the episodes are available in chronological order. There's something like 40 hours of podcasting there, and that's just going back to 2010. I think the the final count is it's nearly 100 hours. You talk about an audio book, you're only talking about, say, six hours or so. So compare that. Or you can also just donate to the program. Some people have asked, you know, Bruce, I want to support the program, but 1888 is a little much. Make any donation. We'll give you the archive. And thanks to all of you listening who have supported. I much appreciate it. Helps the program. Okay, back to business. So in the little town of Ripon, Wisconsin, there is still a little white schoolhouse there. The schoolhouse was built in 1853 to support what was then a new settlement in a pioneer state. Only made a state five years before. The town had about 13 homes, but got a lot of new settlers. Many of the settlers were northerners, like Alan Bove of New York. Though it was a small town, Ripon was not always sleepy. The town discussed politics. In the post office there, or in the general store, people would gather and talk and talk. Some of the villagers were Whigs. Some of the hill people surrounding were Democrats. There were also members of the then Free Soil Party in this area. Anytime these discussions were had, Alan Bove was often seen, a loud man and kind of like a town leader. When the Kansas-Nebraska bill was proposed, and it would demolish the Missouri Compromise and allow slavery in northern states if citizens there voted for it, he and many Wisconsinites were outraged. They knew it would spread slavery and it would spread violence into the U.S. territories. He called a meeting to be held on the evening of February 28, 1854. Now, this meeting was at the Congregational Church in town. A resolution was adopted that if the Nebraska bill would pass, they would throw out old party organizations to the winds and organize a new party on the sole issue of slavery. Well, Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska bill. And then a new meeting was held on the evening of March 20th in the Little White Schoolhouse. The new party was officially formed. The beginning of the Republican Party was not a giant event. It was Bove and about 16 others. Some were Democrats who were breaking away from their party. Others were Whigs, as Bove described it. The actors in that remote little eddy of politics realized at the time that they were making history by that solitary tallow candle in the little white schoolhouse on the prairie. A placard still appears in Ripon as the birthplace of the Republican Party. There are some people who contest this. There was another healthy meeting in Jackson, Michigan. Yet, there's more to the story of Ripon, and it involves the mainstream media of 1854. That schoolhouse meeting would have been just that, a small, forgotten group. Indeed, there were anti-Kansas-Nebraska meetings all over the North. It would have been forgotten if Bove didn't have an advantage. Influence 
with the mainstream media, and by that I mean the 19th century mainstream media, and by that I mean the New York Tribune, edited by Bovey's good friend, Horace Greeley, and read everywhere. On a trip to New York, Bovey had discussed his idea for a new party and a meeting to start it. Greeley loved it. Greeley may have helped name the party, though Bovey claimed to be the one who came up with the name Republican Party. Greeley publicized it in his paper. We should not care much whether those thus united against slavery were designated Whig, Free Democrat, or something else, though we think some simple name like Republican would more fitly designate those who had united to restore the Union to its true mission of champion and promulgator of liberty rather than propagandist of slavery. Rhetorically, the name Republican, which had up to this point been associated with Thomas Jefferson, makes more sense. Because in Kansas, the Republicans felt some un-Republican things had gone on, and they were restoring things like freedom of speech, liberty, trial by jury, and the like that wasn't going on there. So the name Republican fit. With the publicity from Greeley's New York Tribune, the Republican name went, you might say, viral. Word of the party spread. Other local chapters and state-level parties started. A huge meeting we discussed just before in Jackson, Michigan. 100,000 people gathered under the Oaks, where today there's still a sign there. Michigan Republicans took over the state that year. In two years, Bovey's Republicans would do the same in Wisconsin. The blurring of previous party lines. Forget about if your daddy was a Whig or an old Democrat. Forget that. Join us. Join our crusade. Was an accelerant for growth. In their first convention, two years from the Wisconsin meeting, in Philadelphia, they nominated the Explorer Fremont, a hero in the nation for his exploits, to be their candidate for President of the United States. Free soil, free men, Fremont, was their slogan. For a party created two years before, it was fairly successful. Captured most of the northern states, but lost Pennsylvania, Illinois, New Jersey to Buchanan, Maryland to Fillmore. Now, as a national party, the Republican Party's main issue was slavery and the extension of slavery into the territories which they opposed. But it wasn't all that they were for. This is from their 1856 platform. Resolved that a railroad to the Pacific Ocean by the most central and practical route is imperatively demanded by the interests of the whole country, and that the federal government ought to render immediate and efficient aid in its construction. And as an auxiliary thereto, the federal government ought to render immediate aid to the construction of an immigrant road on the line of the railroad. 100 years before Eisenhower, a national highway program. Resolved that appropriations by Congress for the improvement of rivers and harbors of a national character required for the accommodation and security of our existing commerce are authorized by the Constitution and justified by the obligation of the government to protect the lives and property of its citizens. So there you have it. In addition to being free soil, free month, the original Republican Party would have had a liberal personal freedom policy with a focus on helping big business, railroads being the big business and engine of commerce at the times, and a Whiggish like of government spending when used for common purposes like building national roads. This is the Republican Party born in Wisconsin, and by two years after Bovey's meeting, the party would run his state. When war came, Wisconsin was one of the more fervent union-supporting states. You got to think about Northern opinion more than we commonly do because it's more interesting to th Southern history enthusiasts about what was going on during the South, during the war, and because most of the war is focused there, you hear more about that. When you get opinion in the North, you kind of realize why it was difficult to avert a war. It wasn't just about Southern opinion being rigid, but the Northern states were pretty clear on what they wanted as well. Wisconsin was one of those states. Uh, listen to this speech by Wisconsin's governor, 1861, Republican Alexander Randall. The right of a state to succeed from the Union can never be admitted. The United States cannot treat with a state. So long as any state assumes a hostile position to the U.S. government, there can be no reconciliation. A state cannot come into the Union and go as it pleases. The government must be sustained and the laws must be enforced. There you have it. Wisconsin Republicans felt that not only could a state not secede, 
But the union couldn't even talk to them, couldn't reconcile with them, couldn't treat them as neutrals or anything like that. Wisconsin sent over 90,000 soldiers into the Union Army to battlefronts far from its rivers and lakes. 2,000 would fight at Gettysburg. The Wisconsin regiments participated in some of the bloodiest fighting. In the end, the Wisconsin position would prevail. Though the war was devastating, the Wisconsinites that met in the white schoolhouse got what they wanted, the abolition of slavery in America. And for Bove, that was enough. Once slavery was abolished, he declared the Republican Party's mission over, and he joined the Prohibition Party. Yet his fellow Badger State residents did not join him. Wisconsin has been, for most of American history, a Republican state in presidential elections. It voted Republican for 36 years after it had first elected Fremont. In 1892, it broke ranks for Grover Cleveland when he defeated Benjamin Harrison. But there are a lot of reasons for that, and we'll talk about that. It was a blip, though. Wisconsin votes Republican for four more elections after Cleveland. Then in 1912, votes for Wilson, but really doesn't. The combined Roosevelt and Taft vote was enough to elect a Republican if they had been united. Indeed, when Wilson runs his re-election in 1916, the Badger State doesn't want him. Four more Republican votes in presidential elections until you get to the Great Depression, and Wisconsin joins most of the nation in voting for Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. They support him again, 36, 1940, but noticeably, Wisconsin just couldn't go along with a fourth term for FDR in 1944. They vote for Truman in a surprise win in 1948, and then go all the way Republican. All for Eisenhower, they vote for Nixon over Kennedy. Quick stop for LBJ and his landslide at 64. Wisconsin votes for Nixon twice. Quick stop for Jimmy Carter by less than 1%, then votes for Reagan twice. The point here is, for most of its history, Wisconsin was a trusty, grand old party state. But something changed in 88. While the little white schoolhouse, its town, and its surrounding county remained solidly loyal to the party that it birthed, as it does today, the county around Ripon voted for Mitt Romney for president in 2012. As that county remained loyal, the rest of the state went for Michael Dukakis in 1988, and it has voted for a Democratic president every election since then. Well, Republicans want their home state back. And now that you know a bit of the history, it should be no shock that the state is aggressively contested by the Republican Party. Despite recent poor presidential election results, a Republican governor, Scott Walker, was elected, then he survived a recall challenge, Leads in his re-election. State has a Republican senator. It's been a target for some time. Republican pollsters, uh, Republican pollsters have not been fooled by the election results. They started to pick up on in the year 2000 that although it voted overwhelmingly for Bill Clinton's re-election, in 2000, the state was not going to be so out of reach for George W. Bush. Sure, Milwaukee. Sure, a few of the northern Rust Belt counties. We're not touchable. But there were excerpts where voters had hightailed it out of Milwaukee. Bush took this on, Wisconsin, as part of his 2000 strategy. He picked up Racine County on the outskirts of Milwaukee, and Asaukee County that had voted for Dukakis. He picked up Iron and Price in the north, Lincoln and Marathon counties in the middle, St. Croix and Pierce in the west of Wisconsin. Bush almost wins the state. He loses by just 4,000 votes to Gore. In his re-election in 2004, he fares less well, still keeps it close. Kerry takes back Racine, takes back Iron and Pike counties. Bush loses that state just by 10,000 in 2004. So it should not be surprising that the parties continue to battle over counties that both Reagan and Dukakis won at different times. A state that has a high independent feeling, 29% registered independents, one of Ross Perot's best states when he ran in 1992. A state that told pollsters in 2011 that 64% of them were unhappy with the direction of the nation. Nick Anderson writes on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site. Fans of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Looks like the Rust Belt will keep losing electoral votes. This is bad, I think, for Republicans who have been trying to break into that region. Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. I always hear about how Democrats are targeting red states. Nick Anderson writes. But rarely 
from Republicans what blue states they are trying to pick off. Where will they go from here? Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, Good question. And if I put my GOP strategy hat on, and yes, I have a GOP strategy hat, I think I ask the question, do you pop or poach? That's the question. Do you poach Democratic states, blue states, if you will, and turn them red? Or do you pop, pop what you might consider to be Obama's bubble? Gains from these two elections that may not really be gains for the Democratic Party that might have more to do with Obama the man than the Democratic Party. But let's look at the first. If you are going to poach, that is, try to get states from the Democrats, I think you've named some of the states. And Wisconsin is certainly one of them. I mean, Obama's done very well here, but 2000 and 2004 puts it on the table. The last election, 2012, in the Electoral College was 332 for President Obama, 206 for Mitt Romney, 271 needed to win. So the Democrats can afford to lose some states and still win. Let's say you take Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and you poach them. Uh, With those three states, all you get is the Democrat gets 306, Republican 232. All that work, and you really didn't get much from the poaching, which is a lot of work. And you're going to have to spend some resources in these states because they're they're leaning Democrat now. But let's assume it's a regional play here. You add Ohio, figuring that if you aim at these Rust Belts, you're going to pick up Ohio as well. That gets you to 288 to 250. Democrat still wins, but it's closer. For the poach to work, I think you need Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, plus New Hampshire. 274 to 264 Republicans are in the White House. It's a tall order. So as I summon my inner Karl Rove, which is in all of us, I assure you, as I'm sitting in the candidate's living room, be it Governor Walker, be it Governor Kasich, be it Governor Martinez, be it Governor Christie, to me, it seems logical that you're going to look at the electoral maps and say, I don't believe this Obama stuff. I don't believe 2008, and I don't believe the existence of 2012. It was a one-time thing. Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Brian Schweitzer, Martin O'Malley, Andrew Cuomo, Jay Nixon, none of these guys are going to get the uber turnout, particularly of minorities and young voters, that Obama got. So you say, you are going to pop Florida, Virginia, and Colorado. They're GOP states. We want them back. Some of them won just like 50 to 49% in 2012. We can get that back. That's doable. Take them off. Those are red states now. Now, wait, don't argue with me. I said I was summoning my inner Karl Rove here. I don't see a Republican strategy for president 2016 that doesn't involve popping these states. V-A-F-L-C-O. And now, real close, 281 to 257. But the Democrat still wins. You add Ohio and you'll win 275 to 263. So with all this talk of poaching and the like, trying to get some new blue states. Really, the Republican just needs to take back Florida, Virginia, Colorado, and Ohio to win. If one wants to argue that Ohio is out of reach, Rust Belt State, people are angry about the economy, and they're blaming rich people, they like the Obama policies, huge margin in Cuyahoga County, which is hard to overcome. If you want to take Ohio off the table... There's another way to do it. You'd have to get New Hampshire and Wisconsin in addition to Colorado, Virginia, Florida. And then you don't have to worry about Ohio. All of these results are pretty close. Like I talked about 275 to 263. Most elections don't end up this way. One of the closer uh, electoral college elections in 1976 or 1916, it usually doesn't work this way. The election's going to be about the performance of the incumbent party. We don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years. So there's all these things to consider. You don't know who the candidate is, whether they're going to be charming or not. But we're just talking strategy. And aiming resources at a region can help. Look at Bush uh, in 2000. Aiming resources at Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. It didn't help him in those states, but he did win Ohio. Hi, I'm Matt Albers, host of the Pirate History Podcast. The men and women of the golden age of piracy are 
some of the most infamous and often misunderstood characters in all of human history. You know their names. Captain Morgan, Anne Bonny, Henry Avery, Mary Reed, Captain Kidd, Blackbeard. But do you know their stories, their real stories? Every week over on the Pirate History Podcast, we explore the real lives of these pirates. We examine what made these pirates sail the high seas in search of plunder and adventure and revenge. The real stories are a lot more complex and a lot more interesting than the stories most of us have been told. If you'd like to hear the stories of the real men and women who went on the account and sailed under the black flag, Join us on the Pirate History Podcast. So, to answer your question then, I think, yes, if you just look at it like, oh, you know, the GOP is trying to get these Rust Belt states and they're never going to get them and they're losing electoral votes anyway. I think you're right. I mean, that's kind of folly if it was just a goal in and of itself. Wisconsin, for instance, is 10 electoral votes and it's lost some of those over the years. But, when you're adding it to a popping strategy, then you add like a Wisconsin, maybe you get New Hampshire too, that's been doable for Republicans in recent years. You get the election. Aim at Wisconsin to get Ohio. Someone like a Scott Walker starts to make more sense. But if the whole election depends on poaching, that's going to be real difficult. You're going to have to get a Republican candidate that's acceptable to the Philadelphia suburbs. I would love to promise like a new type of electoral map in 2016. But I think it's going to be that same standard election, a small group of swing states, and we all know the names. Scott Charles McGoffin writes, These might be briefer discussion topics for the end of your podcast, but I really would like to hear your thoughts on one, the recently announced Republican 2016 primary and convention schedule, and two, Netflix's Mitt documentary. Okay, I'll take the second first. I haven't watched the Mitt documentary, but we all love candidates after they've lost. I mean, look at Bob Dole. If he had told those funny jokes, he would have been president. But when he ran in 1996, there was no jokes. Anyway, history is not kind to the idea that parties can manipulate the primary schedule for a given result. They tried, and events always seem to change it. Now, one successful way that it's been done is in the Democratic Party, certain rules, the creation of super delegates, the Super Tuesday primary, which featured a bunch of Southern states at once, did help them to get what they kind of wanted, which was a candidate that could win for president. Bill Clinton took advantage of that in 1992. But in many cases, you don't know what you're going to get. You try to front load things and it doesn't work. In 2008, there were so many primaries that were front loaded that it created this large ditch till you got to the later primaries which then became more important but let's look at the changes that the republican party has made they have the first primaries of course iowa new hampshire nevada now and south carolina very diverse states and they're going to punish states that move their schedule up to accommodate them that's fine it's hard to imagine one gop candidate winning all of those states. Though on the Democratic side, I could see Hillary Clinton winning in all those states if she runs. On the Republican side, it's, it's much harder. But then what the Republican Party is doing is making the primary system from there on faster, and they're putting the convention in June to hopefully wrap things up quicker and start attacking the likely Democratic nominee. Now, Democrats are the incumbent party. Their convention will be after. We don't know, yo, we don't know yet when they're going to do their convention, but it will be after that. Uh, so you can't use the convention to attack the nominee. You'll use the convention to attack the Obama administration. I, I think I see what they want. They want one guy in the position to be able to run, to start running immediately, to start raising money for that candidate immediately. I think something that they're forgetting, though, is they might be sorry that they pick a nominee in June because you've got lots of a time now to attack that candidate. And that candidate ceases or could cease to be the challenger anymore. They're now an entity that can be attacked for a very long time. And if it's kind of a novel candidate that people like, 
there's a few months there to fall out of love with them. Making the convention in June sets it up for a possible convention fight. Now, we haven't had one of those since 1976 in the GOP party, but it's certainly possible. But, you know, it's one of these developments we'll watch as it goes on. Thanks for the question. Mr. President, thank you for doing this. So said Bill O'Reilly in his interview with President Obama. Great to be with you, Obama said back to Bill O'Reilly during the interview on Super Bowl Sunday. I find it interesting when these kind of things happen. I mean, obviously, two figures of very different types of politics. Uh, It was a little bit of two people talking around each other and to their various audiences. But at the same time, it was interesting. It's something that should happen more. Bill O'Reilly fired away questions at the president. You know, when did you know there were going to be problems with the computers regarding the Obamacare website? Why didn't you fire Sebelius, the secretary in charge of this? Very pointed question. Why are you trying to transform the nation? You say that. Was it the biggest mistake of your presidency to tell the nation over and over, if you like your insurance, you can keep it? And President Obama answered some of these questions. He was evasive in some other areas, you know. In terms of firing his Secretary of Health and Human Services, he said, you know, my main priority right now is making sure it delivers for the American people and getting the uninsured health care. didn't really answer directly. He did say that he regretted his statement about keeping your health care plan. And he said he was told a lot of things about Benghazi, not just that it was a terrorist attack. And he denied that he released the statement with Susan Rice for political purposes. It was a polite interview, but it was something of a boxing match with only three rounds where it's over too quickly, and then everything had to end. Everybody kind of had their agenda. On Obama's side, it was an attempt to soak on the idea of, hey, I answered my questions and I went the distance with my greatest opposition, a journalist from Fox News, you know. For O'Reilly, it was frank questions, and it seemed at times an opportunity to try to get President Obama into a quote that would then cycle through Twitter and be devastating. The one that seems to be the most lasting is that when President Obama complained that you folks, meaning O'Reilly and Fox, were causing the news stories, Benghazi, IRS, etc., rather than the events themselves. That one seemed to have traction. Other than that, he didn't. there was no significant gotcha moment. All of this has me thinking about 1892, though as far as I'm aware, there was no aggressive interview of President Benjamin Harrison, or anything like that. In 1888, Benjamin Harrison, former Union general in the Civil War, governor of Indiana. Indiana had been a key swing state in the politics of the later 19th century. He was elected to the presidency, defeats Grover Cleveland. But in 1892, things are reversed, and now Harrison is thrown out of office. There are a variety of reasons for why this happened. One was that Benjamin Harrison had not won a popular vote in 1888. He won an electoral college vote. Partisanship was very high. The parties were right at each other. It was almost 50-50. The Republican Party was split in 1892. He only got the nomination in 1888. James Blaine, previous Speaker of the House who had run for president before, decided not to run in 88. Harrison won his nomination on the eighth ballot in the GOP convention. Now, he's been president four years. A lot of people aren't happy. Blaine, who is Harrison's secretary of state, starts making noises about that he would like to run it. It might be his turn for president. So many did not want to renominate Harrison. But his postmaster general, John Wanamaker, had twisted some arms at the convention and got it done. Used the presidential patronage. Harrison was a lethargic candidate in 1892. His wife was ill, indeed. She would die in the middle of the campaign from tuberculosis. But Harrison had another weakness. The cost of beating Grover Cleveland in 1888 was high and came as the result of financing organized by John Wanamaker of Philadelphia, his postmaster general. Wanamaker's statue is still near the city hall in Philadelphia. Wanamaker, after the election... Harrison's postmaster general would dole out the jobs to reward all those who had fundraised. That was the way things were supposed to work. Except that America was changing. This was the era of civil service reform. And now, thanks to the law enacted by a president author in a Democratic Congress, there were some commissioners watching. 
But this didn't stop Washington from operating in the way that Washington normally operated at that time. There would still be patronage, and the commission would be ignored. Well, there was one commissioner in particular on the Civil Service Commission that would plague President Harrison. A member of his own party, Theodore Roosevelt, a young, former hothead in the New York Assembly, failed candidate for mayor. Benjamin Harrison was worried about appointing Theodore Roosevelt. He heard that he had a reputation as a troublemaker. Roosevelt, for his part, did nothing to hide his reputation or beg forgiveness or solicit the job from Harrison though a few of Roosevelt's friends did ask the president to appoint him. Harrison gave in and paid for it. One of Theodore Roosevelt's first acts as a very energetic commissioner was to throw out one of Harrison's oldest and dearest friends who was not qualified for a job. But it would be in Harrison's last year, just as he was up for re-election, that Roosevelt would take on Wanamaker. Hutchinson, Minnesota had some problems. For the adults of Hutchinson, the problem was the teenagers. They kept sneaking off at night to empty barns where they'd brace yourself, dance. Who knew what sort of sin and heavy petting and French literature these barn dances might lead to? No, the adults of Hutchinson, Minnesota did not approve. And neither, it seemed, did the devil. One summer night, Satan himself suddenly appeared in the middle of the dance floor, and the debauched teens ran in fear. He showed up at the next dance, too. For a few months, it seemed like you couldn't go to a late-night barn dance in Hutchinson without getting chased out by the devil, pitchfork in tow. Until one night, when a 14-year-old boy had the good sense to shoot him in the chest. At which point the devil was revealed, Scooby-Doo style but bloodier, to be the local Methodist minister, dressed in a costume and flown in from the roof by rope and pulley. This is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the accidents, mistakes, and bad ideas that helped misshape our world. Find us at ConstantPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Who refused to throw out employees that the Civil Service Commission had declared unfit. Wanamaker responded by accusing Roosevelt of conducting a partisan, biased witch hunt. But it turned out that Wanamaker's own investigators came to the same conclusions as Roosevelt. He just hid the report. But while he hid the report, Wanamaker was out there calling Roosevelt all sorts of names. His reputation besmirched. Roosevelt took him on in a heated congressional hearing. He read to Wanamaker his own investigator's reports, which matched what Roosevelt had said. He accused him of covering up an investigation, keeping employees on the payroll, and interfering with the Civil Service Commission's work. It was an embarrassing moment for the Republican Party, and the Congressional Committee sided with Roosevelt. Poor Harrison, one paper said, the irrepressible Theodore Roosevelt has made him suffer. This coinciding with a scandal about all that action that went on in Minneapolis, where Harrison got the renomination and patronage was doled out. All of this together added to the fact that Democrats were nominating Grover Cleveland, known as Grover the Good, who everyone thought had done a good job with the civil service, with reform Republicans bolting to give Cleveland another chance. Benjamin Harrison was made a one-termer in 1892, and he's not among the most well-known presidents. Yeah, one thing that didn't plague Harrison in 1892, it would a few years later, was the economy. Nor did Harrison have any foreign policy issues of significance. Indeed, his Secretary of State, Blaine, was running things pretty well. A dispute with Chile was uh, worked out. The State of the Union was strong. Even Theodore Roosevelt would campaign for the old general, saying he had an excellent foreign policy. But it was the public sense of incompetence, of scandal and the raw politics and partisanship not working his way that dragged Benjamin Harrison down. So Joe Rosengarten asks me, based on the O'Reilly interview of President Obama, he says, Fox News seems to be banking on presidential scandal as a change maker in 2016. However, it seems anecdotally at least, the old it's the economy stupid is a better indicator of presidential party fortunes. Thanks, Joe. Let's look at that. I think it's more correct not to put all the onus on one cable network, even though they obviously are a conservative network that does cover story, some stories more than others. I mean, of course, you can't watch MSNBC right now without seeing Chris Christie on it and a lot about Bridgegate, and I think that will actually affect presidential politics significantly. 
But if you change it to say, you know, there's a group of Americans who would like to see Democrats defeated in 2016, and they would not mind if a scandal started to take with American voters right now, particularly independents or those 2012 Obama voters that maybe they could turn. So the question is, is presidential scandal a change maker we should be watching in 2016 and has it been in history? Bill O'Reilly gave President Obama opportunities to address healthcare website statements. You know, you can keep your own plan. Benghazi, was it a terror attack? Why did the administration say otherwise? Why did the IRS guy, as O'Reilly described him, come in 157 times to the White House? And the president answered them in some form. But you're right that a lot of what's the questions going on now are focused on things that, if, if, if they break, would become a large scandal, perhaps. So the technical answer, and the answer to that pocketbook question is, the pocketbook is the great predictor of elections. It isn't what it appears. It's only a great predictor of elections when the pocketbook is really, really bad. Then you know the incumbent president is just going to lose. Any recession. 1932, 1980, 2008, 1896. Bad for the party in the White House. But recessions timing the exact year of an election can be rare. I mean, in 1992, the economy was pretty bad, but it was actually starting to climb up in the last couple of months. So it makes it real difficult. Sometimes you have middling economies, like 2004, the one we just had in 2012. Not a great economy, but better than the last election. So the pocketbook, it's not be all and end all. Okay. 1892 is one of those elections where, to some degree, political dynamics played into it. No major economic crisis or foreign policy crisis, and yet the incumbent party is going home. 1976 is another. Ford had kept things fine on the international scene. He's got a GDP growing gangbusters at 5%. He's beat the recession of 73. They run some nice commercials like didn't come up yet with Morning in America, but Morning in America type stuff with President Ford and some happy songs and balloons. But it doesn't matter because Ford had pardoned Nixon and Americans were still angry about Watergate and the pardon linked Nixon to Ford. 100 years before, 1876, you have disappointment with Grant and the scandals in his administration. Babbick, I mean, his chief aide, basically running the whiskey ring liquor operation. Now, Babbick is acquitted mostly because Grant goes to the trial and gives his assurance that Babbick did nothing wrong. It's not largely believed. And then Babbick ends up in another scandal when he gets his new job and involved in helping a burglar who opened up a prosecutor's safe in order to plant evidence on someone else. So it's a it's questions whether Grant was aware of this. Has he done anything to cover it up? It looks bad for his administration. The Democrat, Samuel Tilden, the governor of New York, wins his home state of New York, wins Indiana, wins New Jersey. That should have been the election. I mean, the tide actually went for Tilden in that election. But due to the electoral dispute we all know about in 1876, he does not win the presidency. Teapot Dome presents an interesting case when you look at 1924, because we have this enormous scandal. We're dominating the news, oil just stolen out of Navy reserves, an attorney general, interior secretary on the take. They're both big friends of Warren Harding, big friends of his campaign managers. Everything's looking like the president knew. And President Harding goes to Alaska. We see a nice photo of him in a big warm hoodie. And then he stops in San Francisco on the way back and has a heart attack. A presidential funeral with the caissons and coffins and horses. Now Coolidge is president. Thus, 1924 is a great case study here because Teapot Dome was the talk of the 20s. Constantly in the newspapers, Senate hearings. It looked really bad for the Harding administration. I don't know how Harding survives it. But his party does in 1924 because Coolidge, as vice president, wasn't part of it, didn't pardon any of the Teapot Domers, the vice president's role at this time, you know, we're talking about the 1920s. You don't see the vice president in American government. It's less. So he's kept out of the loop. Thankfully, in this case, that helps. Coolidge, as president now, promptly orders investigations. That helps, too. And the economy does better. And, of course, that helps. The Democrats try. They try hard. They hand out little teapot-shaped placards in 1924 and say, vote for Davis Bryan. They show how... One of Coolidge's backers at the 1924 convention for the Republicans was Ed DeHaney, one of the oil businessmen involved in Teapot Dome. But it doesn't work. They can't link it to Coolidge, and they lose. And they lose big. It goes the other way in 2000. 
Clinton's Monica Lewinsky problems might not be considered a scandal at the level of stealing money from the government or something. As it's so commonly stated, it's about sex and American voters don't care about it. But there's a perjury angle and there's a status of the office problem with this because the incident occurred in the Oval. Does it sink the Democratic Party? Well, I think that Clinton, if running for a third term in 2000, alt history, my opinion, he wins. Gore doesn't, but came awfully close. The scandal is a mixed bag there. It made it more difficult for that moderate Democrat trend, a Southern Democrat that Clinton-Gore team was trying to use. They pulled it off in 1996. They flipped Florida, Arkansas, Tennessee. Made it difficult for Gore to win those states again, his home state of Tennessee or Arkansas. The scandal didn't need to sink the Democrats. My take of it is that Gore wasn't very adept as a politician. His awkward handling of it hurt. He didn't know whether to bring Clinton out or not, whether to run in his own man or not. He was weird in the debates. But then again, the scandal was enough to create a situation that had to be handled, which he handled awkwardly. So its existence had an impact, certainly, on 2000, in addition to many, many other things. So I think that if you look at 2016, it would be much easier to say this. If there's an economic crash in 2015, or if there's a big foreign policy disaster that occurs, 2016 is going to be ugly for any Democrat running. Some of the events being discussed, Obamacare, Benghazi, the like, I see as midterm type issues. And they'll really affect the base that comes out, the turnout that comes out in those elections. They might depress supporters of President Obama if things don't seem to be working. So I see them as more midterm issues of 2016, it would have to really enlarge and reach a larger American mindset to affect 2016, in my opinion. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. As I mentioned, for we do have the archive offer for 1888. You can get most of the programs that we've recorded in the past, www www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Click the link. You will get, within 24 hours, hopefully sooner, an email with a link, and that'll bring you to a website where you can download the episodes. They're in chronological order. You also get the special podcast on representation, What Can 1,100 Members of Congress Do For You? If you like the program, please go out there, tell someone about it. Reviews on iTunes, please favorite us on Stitcher. Make a note on a blog or any forum you participate in. And thanks for listening. Oh, quick shout out to the Don't Worry About the Government podcast. Chris Novembrino heads that up. And we were featured there on episode 223. There's an interview with me. He's done a couple of episodes since then, but he has his archives there. Don't worry about the government.tv.